evening, everyone. Welcome to SOAS. Um, today is our final seminar series for the year, so um, thank you to everyone who's contributed through the year. We've made an amazing, we, uh, Faisy and her, and her team has made an amazing album of the photographs of uh, all of the seminar series through the year, so you should check that out. It's, it's uh, prominently displayed on our website. Um, and yeah, thanks for the intellectual engagement, thanks for coming, thanks for being part of our community. Today is a very special day. We're going to be launching uh, Suzanne Jasper's book, um, Power, Politics and Profit, The History of Food Aid and Conflict in Protracted Crisis. Um, Suzanne Jasper is, is a research associate. She has over 30 years of um, uh, experience in research and operational work. Uh, she has recently acquired her PhD from Bristol University. And, um, has, and works as a senior research fellow at the ODI's Humanitarian Policy Group. Uh, I'm going to hand the floor over to Suzanne to, to outline her book, to uh, present the main arguments to you, and then I'm going to invite uh, David Keane and Laura Hammond to make some commentary, uh, contribute to the debate, and then we'll uh, give it over to the floor. I'm going to uh, introduce our two panellists now so that we don't have to break uh, during the proceedings. I think um, David Keane is known to many people here. He is a professor of complex, emergency, complex emergencies at LSE. His study on the political economy of famine was published by Princeton University Press as the benefits of famine in 1940, 1994, 1944. <laughs> He's aged very well. <laughs> um, that's a, still a seminal book. We study famine. We read uh, David Keane's book. Uh, the Benefits of Famine. He's also the author of Economic Functions of Violence in Civil Wars, Endless War, Hidden Functions of the War on Terror, and Useful Enemies When Waging War is More Important Than Winning Them. These are not the only books David's written. I was looking down and said, oh, you missed out these ones. And he said, oh, not time to, not time to talk about them all. Um, he formerly worked as a researcher, consultant, and journalist. After David, we'll be inviting Laura Hammond to make a commentary. I think Laura Hammond is known to absolutely everyone here. She's a professor uh, in our Development Studies Department, and she's the GCRF Challenge Leader for Security Protracted Conflict, Refugees and Forced Displacement Project. She also leads the London International Development Centre's Migration Leadership Team and the EU Trust Fund's Research and Evidence Facility for the Horn of Africa. This is why she has to eat her lunch at 5 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> um, uh, I should say also that Suzanne's book will be on sale. Uh, it is at the discounted price of £40. It is a hardback book, so you can use it for all sorts of things, not just reading. Um, <laughs> uh, there's only 10, so, so obviously we'll have some um, audition if you'd like to buy one of those. Uh, if not, you can get a flyer and you can buy the book online at a 30% uh, percent discount when you get there. If you're tweeting, the, the hashtag is SOASDevStudies or hashtag ESRC. No idea what that means. Paisley asked me to say it. Um, so please give a very warm welcome to Suzanne Jaspers. Thank you very much. Nice to see a big crowd here. Um, anyway, I, I wanted to start by just saying um, a few words on why I wrote this book or after, you know, um, uh, basically I did a PhD after 25 years of doing operational work and, and, and um, working as an applied researcher. So, I mean, basically, well, the, the book is based on my PhD and the book it, and it, the PhD itself built on my own experience of working in food aid for pretty much kind of 25 years and much of that was in Sudan. So over this period, I was kind of continuously confronted with um, you know, the politics of food aid at global and at local level. For example, I, I, I would often see that in, in food distributions, um, you know, the most vulnerable people would be excluded. I also noticed that over the years, you would <coughs> approaches seem to be continuously reinvented. So we kind of move from livelihoods to protection to resilience. Um, but, but often, when you're talking about food aid or food assistance, many of the interventions remain the same, um, and the, the political challenges just persisted. Um, but maybe most importantly, um, I realized that by the 2000s, um, many, many countries had received food aid for a very long time, and 
yet no study had been done to look at you know, the impact or the effects of food aid within one country over time. So that's what I set out to do. Now, this is the contents of the book. So I, I start by looking at kind of food aid and power. And as many of you probably will know, um, you know, food aid has played a role in geopolitics, you know, uh, supporting uh, friendly states that are friendly to the West. Um, locally, you've, you probably know about studies that, you know, food aid uh, supports the powerful government, soldiers, militia, and as I said earlier, exclude, often exclude the most vulnerable. Or, you know, uh, studies have highlighted the manipulation of food aid in conflict for theft, diversion, taxation, and how it can strengthen those in power. So, in this book, I take a slightly different perspective. I mean, I look at food aid practices themselves as a way of governing. So, I use kind of Foucault's concept of governmentality and regimes of practices to look at ways of governing beyond the state and to look at a kind of a set or a set of linked practices, uh, techniques, tactics, organizations, which in themselves or combined rather can influence behavior, power relations, or become a way of managing populations. And as I go through, you will see how that, how that happened. So what I do is basically, I first look at um, international regimes of food aid practices and how they changed over time. Then I look at their impact or the effect in Sudan, then in Darfur, and then I look more closely at the kind of, you know, basically the last 10 to 15 years and look at it from kind of different perspectives, from the perspective of government, aid agency, traders, transporters, and beneficiaries. Um, so in, my, in the book, as a, I take as a starting point the second decade of the 2000s, when you still have high levels of acute malnutrition, but international organizations are reducing food aid and have very little access to crisis-affected populations. And this is still the case today. So what you have is a situation in 2004, 2005, where you have you know, a, a massive humanitarian crisis, but also <coughs> WFP's largest food aid operation. But by 2010, uh, very little humanitarian access and existing food aid essentially controlled by the Sudan government. So what I do is I, I then kind of go back 50 years and look at, you know, how the history of food aid in Sudan can explain this strange situation. Now, very briefly also, the main argument of my book is that in 50 years of food aid, actually this food aid rarely had its intended um, effect of improving production, saving lives, supporting livelihoods. Darfur in 2005, <coughs> was in fact a, a, an exception. Um, but instead, you see a kind of semblance or, or, or type of development that actually has supported the Sudan government and its closely linked kind of private sector. But crisis-affected populations themselves have been abandoned to um, become resilient in the context of perfect, a permanent emergency. So what I'm going to do now is just talk briefly about these changing regimes of practices, international regimes of practices, and then look more at the effects in Sudan and Darfur, and in particularly why I say um, crisis-affected populations have been abandoned. So I identify kind of three regimes of practices, uh, and I've called them state support, livelihood support, resilience regime, and these quotes illustrate um, really the ideology in these different regimes. So the first, fairly straightforward, um, food aid to strength, it was largely used to strengthen states and to benefit donors. Then, you know, in, 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 livelihood, in the livelihood support regime, you basically have kind of UN and NGOs taking responsibility for lives and livelihoods of crisis-affected populations. And this includes during conflict, for example, some of you may have heard of Operation Lifeline Sudan. Um, and as you can also see from the quote, you see a proliferation of objectives during this period. Then there's a resilience regime um, where we kind of move away from food aid and food assistance to much more kind of medicalized nutrition and kind of a, a focus on individual behavior to promote resilience. And as you can see, 
here, I mean, it's, it's really malnutrition and, and food security are seen as key to resilience. So, very click, quickly on the, sh on, on, on the shifts uh, in these, in these um, regimes of practices. I mean, why the shift from state support to livelihood support? I mean, in part because, I mean, in part because, um, you know, increase, increasing critiques of the state support regime, of the kind of political and trade objectives of food aid, changing domestic policies, development policies, later the end of the Cold War, as well as, you know, a perception now that African states were, were weak and corrupt. So the, the um, so, UN, I mean, donors basically try to bypass the state at this stage. Then also in responses to famine and refugee crises, um, people like Alex Dewell in Famine at Kills found that, you know, food or relief rarely reached um, vulnerable populations and instead they had to develop their own coping strategies. So you see a shift there from kind of, you know, focus on the state to focus on the individual. Also a range of new practices that I'm sure many of you will have heard of, you know, famine early warning, targeting, new norms and standards. Then the shift from livelihood support to resilience. Um, uh, again, a combination of kind of uh, failure of past practices and global and global and as I will talk about later, local politics. So many of the practices of the livelihood regime failed. Famine early warning rarely led to response. Targeting rarely uh, reached the most vulnerable. By the end of the 1990s, you had more people in protracted crisis. Um, and crisis itself became normalized. normalized. So you would have uh, need much, much higher levels of acute malnutrition to lead to a response. Um, then with the war on terror and the 2008 food crisis, you have a greater focus by donors on, on, on stability and on resilience. And as I said earlier, food security and nutrition became key uh, in this. The other things that, that became more important here is a kind of more quantitative measures, a focus on, on, on treatment and behavior, and increased private sector involvement. All of these I can talk about a lot longer, but I don't have time now. So why do I say this is an abandonment? First of all, there's an, a kind of implicit acceptance of permanent crisis um, that, that, you know, basically we're talking about survival amongst constant danger rather than kind of, you know, real kind of increases in, in, in well-being. Then there's a sort of medicalization of nutrition, which focuses on kind of treatment and specialized products. And, you know, really talking about nutrition as an object in itself rather than looking at its causes. Um, um, a focus on, again, a focus on behavior and individual responsibility kind of makes it easier to withdraw food aid. And this in turn is, 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 is also facilitated by an increase in, in remote management, um, which kind of increases the kind of physical and emotional distance um, between, um, you know, aid worker and, 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 and crisis victim. And, this remote management became much more important because of denials of access, which I will go on to talk about now. So, within Sudan, I mean, now I'm looking at kind of what were the actual effects in Sudan and Darfur. So, within Sudan, um, really these last two periods, the livelihoods and the resilience regime, can also be seen as a kind of a, a struggle for control over food aid and the agencies that, that provide it. So, I mean, to start with, the state support regime was not very contentious. I mean, the, it, it, it basically was intended to support the Sudan government, so it's not contentious on their, their part. Um, in the case of WFP projects, they largely kind of failed to, you know, they were mostly kind of uh, intended to improve uh, production, um, but they still kind of supplemented government uh, salaries. So still some form of government support. Now in the livelihoods regime, you'll see uh, at the bottom, um, gra at the gra on the graph, um, you see a sudden increase in food aid in, in 1985. And the other thing I should say is you see a shift from the uh, the state support regime is mainly kind of focused on the center of Sudan, where the kind of uh, wealthier um, 
the yeah, best sort of population lives. I mean, the, and, 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 and most of the people from the government come from central Sudan. Um, so now you see a shift from the center to the peripheries. That's one, sen one sense. I've already said suddenly organizations started delivering directly to communities. So this was actually seen as a, by the government officers that I interviewed as a way of kind of bypassing the state. And the response to that was really to you know, try and exert kind of uh, uh, greater control over, uh, well, to try and deny the need for food aid and to exert greater control over humanitarian agencies. I mean, basically, from this stage, the, the Sudan government's thought of um, food aid and international agencies as kind of undermining their own governance and um, in the case of kind of Operation Lifeline Sudan in the south as supporting rebel movements. So basically, they were a threat to Sudan's sovereignty. Now, the 1991 famine was particularly... Um, controversial um, because um, following the, the Islamist coup in 1991, self-sufficiency was one of the aims of the new government. And this led, again, to, to, to ways of control, exerting more control over international agencies. And this took several forms. First of all, kind of the, the denial of famine, but later also kind of learning the language. So for, you know, uh, very keen on kind of food economy, local purchase, relief to development, all of which serve both kind of, could, could be taken to serve uh, political objectives of reducing food aid as well. Uh, in addition, um, restrictions of, ac of access uh, for international agencies were a key, a key feature. Now at the same time as kind of denying uh, food aid or, 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 or or trying to restrict food aid. At the same time, traders and transporters closely uh, actually uh, benefited from delaying food aid responses, which, which could maximize profits. And um, because, yeah, I mean, uh, um, through various means, I mean, um, as, as agencies became more desperate to provide food, you know, they would pay more to transporters or that food airlifted in. And, and many of these transporters and traders were closely linked to the Sudan government. Um, so in fact, um, the, some of the, thing, the things that um, David Keane showed in the benefits of famine, in terms of the, ben the economic benefits of, of, of limiting food aid to certain groups, um, those continued to evolve uh, throughout the 1980s and the 1990s. Now when we talk about the resilience regime, I mean really, you, you, you see the Sudan government taking control of, of food aid. It's, um, and you really see the Sudanization of, of food aid. And you can see this in the development of Sudan's own food aid apparatus and the distribution of government food aid. Um, now, for example, the strategic, yeah, strategic grain reserve, in theory, could be seen as a positive development. But in fact, it was very closely linked um, to kind of the larger traders who were had links with the government. The same for government food aid was mainly went to, of, of course, it goes to government held areas and to um, and to government supporters. So let's look at um, Darfur. Oh my God! Okay, I thought I timed myself. Okay, so within Darfur. We have three, uh, look at the three regimes of practices again. During the state support regime, very little um, food aid. Um, during the 1990s, during the livelihood regime, almost continuous famine, food insecurity, and also food aid. And almost every single evaluation at that time um, shows that um, you know, food aid had very little or no impact. Now, the two, WFP's 2004 operation in response to the kind of huge uh, humanitarian crisis and conflict is actually one of the few, or maybe even the only example, where food aid effectively uh, contributed to reduce malnutrition and mortality, and, and actually also supported livelihoods. <coughs> now, um, the political and economic effects also continue to evolve, and many transporters now 
had massive contracts. They don't, many of them have international companies, but also they made a lot of money from kind of uh, buying up the food sold by beneficiaries in Darfur and, selling, and taking it back to Khartoum to sell. Moving quickly forward, um, I might need two, two minutes extra. Um, so let's look more closely at the resilience regime in Darfur. Um, so from 2008, you see a decrease in food aid, partly because of funding, partly because of declines in access, but also an assumption that people can meet some of their own food needs. And remember, this is when we see the shift to new practices, uh, nutrition, cash transfers, and the private sector is, are all seen as means of promoting resilience. Nutrition deteriorated, and kind of food security information is contradictory, but WFP's indicators show it to be decreasing. So you're delinking nutrition from food security, which again uh, kind of facilitates assumptions that, um, that malnutrition is due to problems of behavior um, rather than, than food insecurity. Now, at the same time, a reduction in food aid uh, will facilitate facilitates counterinsurgency operations and policies to empty the camps. So really from, I guess from 2010 onwards, um, most food aid goes to government held areas. International food aid largely reducing um, and, um, and even inside the camps you have some government food aid, uh, largely to kind of attract um, IDP leaders over to the government side. And this, is, this has largely been successful by now. At the same time, very little information about livelihoods strategies. Um, so what we know, I mean, from 2008 onwards, very, very little known. So what you have then now is you have this kind of three different realities that, that people are, uh, that, that different kind of groups of people are operating in. I mean, uh, on the part of international agencies, you have this kind of perception that, you know, malnutrition is due to cultural and behavioral factors. Um, remaining food insecurity is a problem of people's own actions. Um, and basically, it's, it's, a, it's a regime where conflict becomes invisible. Now, this kind of converges with the government's kind of reality where, you know, it says, you know, Western food aid undermines government and therefore needs to be reduced or controlled. Um, agencies are spies. Um, and, 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 but at the same time, you know, by making this invisible, I mean, it's, it, it's possible for the government to continue to manipulate food aid for its own ends. And um, finally, I mean, what it means is that the realities of, of, of long-term uh, Sudanese aid workers and beneficiaries who basically talking... Uh, you know, they, they, they feel that this, this food aid is reduced to kind of make them work or to make them return home. But at the same time, um, you know, many of the issues like inadequate access to land, um, uh, threats to livelihoods are, are ongoing. And this, this reality is really suppressed with this kind of two dominant um, realities of the government and, and, the, um, and the international aid agencies. Um, I can say more about that, but not now. Um, so really, a few implications. Um, I think this kind of this research really highlights the need to take a more critical approach to current uh, or contemporary practices, and also that if if um, the evolution of regimes of practices is partly due to kind of global and local politics, but it's, we're not necessarily seeing, it, seeing a linear trajectory of kind of scientific progress. We can also go back and look at, you know, in the past, you know, were there things that were particularly useful? So maybe we need to go think again about livelihoods approach. Maybe we need to think again about something called social nutrition or, or qualitative methods. Um, the other thing is that no one, no one in Sudan perceived food aid to be neutral or impartial. Um, so, I mean, aid agencies can talk until they're blue in the face, but, I mean, it's, it, their, their own knowledge and experience is that this is not the case. And, of course, this, this, you, you need to take this into account in your programming to be trans transparent about this, 
and to ensure that the kind of the the the, the, the knowledge and um, experience, especially of Sudanese aid workers, is 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 part of this kind of deliberation about programming. And then finally, um, the importance of proximity and, and solidarity. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's with the kind of increase in remote programming, I think it's important to realize that, you know, humanitarianism is more than a kind of technical exercise of putting people in categories or um, estimating need, the best way of estimating needs or treating malnutrition. It's also about, um, you know, making, uh, talking to people and making kind of human connections. So I'm going to end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, I'd like to invite David now to make some comments. There you go. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to um, be able to say a few words about um, uh, Suzanne's book. I think I think it's a very important book. Um, I've been sort of rereading it, reading it, and rereading it, and it it really it gets better and better every time. Um, so not that it was bad the first time I read it. I thought it was really good then, but uh, the and and very disturbing. And I think with with the. You know, if we think about Donald Trump, as a lot of us try not to, they, you have this idea with Trump that, you know, he's done something very, very new and bizarre and sort of created this world of alternative facts, you know, and that he's taken us into a world of fantasy and a world where there are kind of, in a way, magical solutions for very complex social and economic problems. And I think reading a book like this, you know, it's very educational, uh, even really on a philosophical level, because it, it reminds us, and you know, Suzanne is certainly not the only person to, to do this, and Zoe's, uh, Zoe's own work does this in a, in a different way. Um, and Hannah Arendt, you know, look at her article, um, Lying in Politics, it's a fantastic, a uh, portrait of this kind of a flight into unreality, collective flight into unreality during the Vietnam War and the kind of scientific gloss that that collective official flight from reality actually had at the time. And it's that kind of scientific gloss on a, a flight from reality today, you know, that Suzanne, I think, is... is uh, Drawing our attention, drawing our attention to, and we have to be aware, really, that very extreme uh, sort of, in a way, looking glass worlds can be constructed out of what appear to be very scientific instruments. And of course, there's nothing really wrong with science, or at least in my opinion, you know, we need, in a way, more science. We need more evidence, more testing. Uh, but there's a lot of people that get cut out of what counts as scientific, and this is, I think, why Suzanne's analysis is, you know, it's very Foucauldian, it's very, uh, of, of much wider relevance even than Sudan or emergency, uh, emergency aid. And, um, you know, if you, if you are interested in Foucault and you find it a little bit um, highfalutin or hard to you know, to sort of make concrete. I think this is a great uh, education, in a way, in what some of the things that, that he was trying to, to get at. And this, you know, this, the idea that you can uh, sort of have a mass outbreak of dependency uh, that, that, that kind of spreads across Western Sudan, given the tiny amounts, relatively tiny amounts of emergency food aid actually being distributed. Uh, there's, there's a sort of a huge uh, disjuncture there. There's an uh, amazing, uh, at one level, amazing uh, reluctance to talk about the real causes of uh, food insecurity and malnutrition and so on. And this sort of very bizarre world where in a way the level of food rations, 
which is a very basic thing, um, becomes, in a certain kind of official discourse, uh, explicitly irrelevant to levels, high levels of acute malnutrition, which are actually sometimes admitted and acknowledged. And there's this process there, you know, which Suzanne has referred to already, of a kind of a victim blaming, you know, that is very extreme anyway. And I think, you know, when we look at a lot of different uh, functional but dysfunctional systems, you know, systems that are in a way failing in terms of their expressed aim, but yielding a number of benefits, uh, a number of benefits along the way. You do get this very peculiar distribution of shame, which is out of all proportion to the actual distribution of responsibility. But even as uh, governments and perhaps to a degree international donors sort of get themselves off the hook, they are necessarily either going to point to a sort of, if you like, contingent factors like the chaos or the weather or constraints which somehow acquire a, um, an immutable quality or even a theological quality which takes them away from human action or they're going to do victim blaming and that, that, you know, that is a very big uh, <coughs> phenomenon which I think Suzanne has drawn our attention to and she mentioned um, you know, this pattern of exclusion for the most part of rebel held areas from international food aid especially from about 2010 the running down of food aid to IDPs and IDP camps. These, you know, these are very much in line with government uh, priorities and it's really, it's a case of, I think, old wine in new bottles, uh, which I think is one of Mark Duffield's uh, phrases. And, 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 and even the bottles are not really that new, you know, because uh, it, it's, it's, it's extreme manipulation of food aid for political and military purposes. And then an international regime imposed over the top of it, which seems to be very oddly uh, still obsessed in a way with the prevention of dependency, this kind of Victorian ideology that people are going to be morally uh, corrupted as soon as you give them a small amount of, uh, of assistance. And these two things work together very strongly and very perniciously uh, now, just as they did in the famine that you know I was investigating in 19, I was going to say 1944, but 1988 uh, in Sudan. You know this very uh, clear uh, intention, really, of a number of powerful actors to create a famine uh, in Bar el Ghazal to uh, withhold relief from that area to make money out of the price movements, out of the oil and so on. And then an international regime sort of imposed on that, which was oddly uh, self-congratulatory when it came to uh, the more or less total failure to get relief into those areas. So, you know, people would talk about um, there's a beneficial economic change that's taking place as southern Sudan shifts from pastoralism into agricultural production. And these processes of mass uh, out-migration are speeding that up. Or they would say, well, we didn't get a lot of food aid in to help these people. Uh, one of the most severe famines ever recorded. But we did at least succeed uh, in not creating dependency. And Zoe has uh, documented a lot of this mm -hmm. in other contexts as well. You see it in Sierra Leone in the 90s. You know, this idea that conflict is always just about to end and therefore you can legitimately cut uh, people's rations and yet somehow the conflict doesn't end. And these are things that are being in a way wished away, uh, the continuing conflict in Darfur. Um, and I think it's, you know, Suzanne has given us a very uh, fascinating account, really, of, of uh, a kind of appropriation. It's a kind of rebirth of a very old discourse about dependency. But then on top of that, 
an appropriation of some uh, recent and not so recent critiques of emergency uh, food aid, the idea that food can fuel the political economy of war, um, the idea that it can undermine government sovereignty, and the idea that it can interfere with local economies and so on. These things have all been taken up and in a way mis, uh, misappropriated. Five minutes, yeah. I mean, she paints this rather alarming picture of you know, going to the remotest parts of, of uh, Darfur and you'll find somebody there reading Mark Duffield. Uh, you know, somebody who probably understands Mark a lot better than uh, Suzanne or, 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 or myself. And there's a kind of a, you know, this is, a, this is an interesting world in which every time a system is uh, critiqued, that critique can be taken up for purposes other than the one for which it was intended. So we have to be, we have to sort of try and keep an eye on that process. And I think, um, There are so many instances, you know, around the the world. The the uh, crisis in Sri Lanka in 2009, uh, the war ending there, where you know you had this very strange uh, unwillingness on the part of key international actors to talk about really the key things that were driving the humanitarian crisis. It's a very selective vision, in a way, and it, leads, it led, in that instance, to a kind of um, criminal, really, naivety about the government's uh, alleged intention to create a safe zone in the north um, in order to protect the Tamils that it said it was trying to protect, and then the mass shelling of that safe zone, you know, under the eyes of the international community. You had a kind of a Faustian bargain where people were keeping silent in order to maximize their access to the most needs affected and conflict affected areas, but then actually unable to get that access on the whole uh, in the end. So a kind of a trade-off, if you like, between silence and access, but then the access doesn't materialize in the end. And I mean, I think there is perhaps a danger with, uh, you know, the, the book that Suzanne has produced. It's certainly a danger with the kind of thing that I do and uh, Mark Duffield. That, uh, you know, you could turn around and say, as I think WFP uh, at one point said to, to Suzanne, well, you know, what exactly uh, should we be doing differently? And of course, Suzanne has really a fantastic set of answers to that. But at the same time, uh, more or less, um, <laughs> it, it's, you know, it, it is a good question because these are constraints. You can't just wander around Sudan talking about how the government is trying to foment <laughs> the emergency and use uh, food aid. As a, as a weapon of war. So people are actually keeping quiet about certain things in a way quite strategically and at a certain level, uh, uh, understandably. And there's this thing that Suzanne draws attention to where um, aid workers are more interested in talking about the kinds of things that they feel they can do something about than the kinds of things that they <coughs> feel they can't do anything about. And again, in a way, that's quite understandable. But what seems to happen is that then that builds up into a huge kind of regime of truth, as, as Suzanne puts it, or regime of untruth, where collectively and over a period of time, this incredible fantasy world is created where the conflict is essentially wished away. The government is put off the hook in terms of how it's constantly stoking that conflict. The international community is put off the hook. And of course, a key part of the context for this now is that the international community and the European Union in particular, and Suzanne has written very powerfully about this as well, uh, with Margie Buchanan-Smith in particular, um, the European community is very concerned to outsource migration control 
and to put forward Sudan as a kind of island of stability <laughs> in an unstable region, a partner in a kind of international war against crime and people <coughs> smuggling. And in that context, you know, it becomes very, very convenient to actually wish away the Darfur conflict, uh, to collude with processes where actually the perpetrators of genocide in Darfur have been incorporated into border guard units, uh, government border guard units, which are then preventing out migration by the victims of genocide in Darfur, and then turning around to the EU and saying, well, we're doing this in your name, and you should, uh, you should reward us for it. So, I mean, some of these contexts change compared to, say, um, uh, I've got roughly no minutes left. Compared to, say, 1988, you, know, you haven't got the Cold War. You've got a, a much more technologically sophisticated system. There's critiques of aid and so on. Uh, but a lot of things are remaining the same. And I think there's a lot of international uh, games or endeavors in terms of perhaps the war on terror and now the so-called war on illegal migration that are actually playing into the hands of governments that want to um, manipulate food aid in the ways that Suzanne has uh, outlined. And some of these kind of silences that she's talking about, understandable as they may be on a, a sort of a micro day-to-day -day level for a relatively powerless aid worker. You know, if you put it all together and you find that, you know, even the people at the top of say WFP are not really talking frankly about what's going on. This then becomes you know, a very big shield to hide behind and it opens the door for this kind of outsourcing of uh, migration control and some of these very um, uh, terrible really processes that are, that are underway at the moment. So, um, Thank you, David. Um, I'm going to pass straight on to Laura, uh, and then we'll start to ask some questions, which I think we'll be generating as we speak. Great. Thanks. Um, so I don't work on Sudan. I'm not going to talk about Sudan. But um, I, I really appreciated um, what Susanna said tonight, and, and the book itself, and as well, David's remarks. Um, it, and I'm coming at this from a perspective I work in other, in Ethiopia and Somalia, and Somali areas. Um, but also I've just been writing an essay for the Global Hunger Index, which is uh, every year it puts out a um, report and it, and it kind of ranks countries according to uh, where they stand with regard to food security. Um, so I wrote an essay for this year's report on forced migration and hunger. So I've kind of been thinking about some of these issues. And, um, and, and I think that that Sudan's, uh, Sudan, Suzanne's book <laughs> really nicely um, el uh, illustrates several elements that I was trying to get across, which is hard to get across in a, in a kind of broad essay like that. <clears throat> so it's really helpful to have this kind of concrete, empirically driven uh, analysis, rich analysis that can, can bring some of these points to life. But I thought I would maybe kind of having gone into, having looked now at these, this example sort of back up and and pull out what may be some useful um, kind of key points, which are also echoed in this essay. Um, and I, I kind of was thinking about, you know, there's been years and years since, since at least 1944, mm -hmm. um, but if not, uh, uh, throughout, there's been a long history of people writing about food security and trying to explain the political economy of famine. Um, David's work, Alex Duvall's work, Mark Duffield's work, all of this, Suzanne's as well. I mean, lots of people have been writing about, you know, the very the, the fact that that famine and hunger are are political. Forced migration is political, um, you know, and and yet still we have these response mechanisms that do not um, adequately respond to the needs of those who face food insecurity, who are displaced, who are affected by conflict. And I was sort of thinking, why is that the case? And and, and kind of came up with these ideas of, of four different 
kind of myths, in a sense, which I've just retitled this essay now, Components of a Fantasy, based on David's uh, remarks. Um, sort of four kind of basic points, and they all come out in, in Suzanne's work. The first is the idea that, um, that displacement and famine are both political processes. We know that the literature has shown us that year, time and time again, and yet when you look at response actions, whether it's policy or what aid workers actually do in the field or what kinds of food security policies are being implemented, they're, they're absolutely silent on most elements of the political nature of food insecurity. Um, they don't take into account the very, particularly in long-standing crises, like in, of which Sudan is a prime example, the history of food aid, how food, how food aid has become intricately intertwined into not only the conflict dynamics, and, and David's written a lot about that as well, but just into daily life. You have people who have been receiving food aid for basically their entire lives. And it's, for them, food, food aid is not an emergency intervention. It is something that you can plan on, you can expect. You have never known anything else than. And yet it continues to be um, sort of that, that historical nature of how food aid becomes part of that political economy of life and of conflict and of displacement it really is, is not well reflected in policy. Um, it also means that when we come to think about things like peace building, uh, we don't understand peace building as a process that really involves, if not disentangling the political economy of food aid and of humanitarian assistance more broadly, than at least of trying to understand how to create alternative incentive structures, which again has been, have been written about by those gathered here, um, to try to find ways of providing uh, incentives to work towards peace rather than to work towards war. The very designation of famine itself is a political tool. Um, and when uh, you hear the, last year when um, South Sudan was declared to be affected by famine, in 2011 when Somalia was affected by famine, um, you saw a huge kind of international operation switch into gear to respond to that problem. Not so much to respond to it in political terms, but to respond to it with a massive stuff dumped on top of the country, basically. One might ask the question of why in the current climate, um, the situation in Yemen hasn't um, excited the same kind of response as we've seen in those other cases, but we could come back to that in the discussion. Um, I thought it was really useful that Suzanne mentions that, that food aid is not seen as being impartial or neutral in any context. That's certainly the case with regard to most forms of humanitarian assistance. And, and yet, and it's also again part of this sort of silence about the political nature of of food aid and, and of conflict and displacement. The second point, so that's the first point, that, that displacement and famine and food aid are highly political processes. The second is that humanitarian tools, there's an assumption that humanitarian tools are sufficient to respond to these kind of crises. If you have a situation like Sudan with decade upon decade of a so-called emergency uh, situation, you can of course, it makes sense to us in this room to, uh, to question why we would just respond to that in humanitarian terms. Yet on the ground, that is the, that is the primary tool which is used uh, to respond. And the, and, and the proposal is, of course, that it needs to be much more of a developmentally focused approach, but also a politically focused approach that tries to get at the question of why is hunger, hunger replicating itself? Why is, there a, why is food insecurity replicating itself? That, is, that can't be just uh, a climatic need factor or a technical problem, but it has to be, in, at, at its root, a political problem. <clears throat> it has to be related to as such. Um, the third uh, kind of point is about um, uh, sort of the, the third kind of component of this fantasy is the idea that um, we have to build on resilience. And this is huge, resilience is a huge buzzword within the humanitarian and development community now. And yet, Time and time again, we see that food aid uh, typically trounces, uh, tramps upon resilience, uh, disempowers people, and prevents them from being able to ex exercise their own resilience, whether that's by um, limiting their own mobility, by undermining their own livelihood systems, as Suzanne's presentation really shows, uh, those who are engaged in trying to provide the most basic support to people, not really coming to terms with understanding how do livelihood systems work, how, how, where, are the, where are the opportunities to build upon people's 
resilience. A basic kind of truth is that people do get on with trying to help themselves. They don't sit waiting for food aid or any other kind of aid to uh, be uh, given to them. Um, and so, so there are two dangers with regard to that. One is that one can assume that people can, are over resilient <coughs> in the sense that they can help themselves out of their own crisis and that there isn't really a need to do very much. And that, uh, that mistake is made time and time again. And the other is that, is not understanding the nature of that resilience. And so in fact, trying um, kind of counteracting it through, through um, an unintentional kind of misappropriated, mistargeted forms of food aid. The final kind of component of this fantasy is uh, the idea that displacement um, and conflict generates movement across large distances. It feeds the, the European hysteria around the idea of people um, flooding into European, across European borders when in fact we know that 95% of displacement takes place within regions of origin, particularly in countries that are extremely poor. Sudan is 112th out of 119 countries on this global hunger index. South Sudan doesn't even men merit a mention because there is no data to, to, un to figure out where it would lie, but it's certainly at the bottom of the index as well if it had data. So, so these are places that are affected by conflict and displacement, and, and it's a, not, a clo not entirely closed system, but, they are, but really the, the dynamics, the political dynamics that are driving them and the responses that can address them are to be found within those regions. And so there's a real lack of understanding of that and a real kind of directing of resource in disproportionate ways. So at externalizing EU borders when in fact it should be spent more thinking about the, these political natures of, of um, food aid. So when you get to that question of what can be done, I guess, this, you know, in the most simple terms, Mon might say you could take these four components together and say, well, it's not about new, knowing new things. It's about trying to make actions match those things that we know and, and really engaging with them in, in very meaningful ways. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't take, uh, here I, we, we supervise masters and PhD students and we say, yeah, go out and learn about these new things. In fact, there's, it's important to learn things, but it's also important <laughs> to, to, build, to build actions based on what is already known. And there's a real deficit, I think, when it comes to those, to those uh, aspects. Um, yeah, I think actually that's all I wanted to say, so I'm going to end there. Great, thank you very much indeed, Laura. Um, I think one of the one of the things that we come across when we study humanitarianism is this kind of clash of of staff contradictions all the time. And, and listening to the three speakers tonight, I've identified, I mean, the normal one between the political and the technical, and how to fix those two together. But then. The idea of, of science and maybe even just pra pragmatism on one side and fantasy on the other. I'm struck also by the, the contradiction between um, the intimacy of biopolitics, the, the use of you know, controlling people's food, like where they can live, what they can eat, and at the same time a remoteness that is now characterizing uh, the assistance that people are receiving. Dependency versus resilience. Uh, urgency and visibility against the idea of, of a permanent emergency. And I think ultimately what David is saying and drawing them all out is kind of their security versus our security and seeing a kind of othering going on through the process of humanitarian assistance. So that was my reflection. I would like to hear uh, questions from the floor. Um, do we have, we have men and microphones and women and microphones? <laughs> Um, so I'll take a few and then um, identify yourself, say who you are, friendly wave, and um, also if you want to direct it at a particular panel member, please feel free. Yeah, please. Hi. Hey, so I was just wondering, are there any efforts made, sort of, to link the fact that Sudan's agriculture is largely mechanised, which obviously has its impact on desertification, and sort of actually building some sort of resilient through different practices which might be less prone to desertifying um, arable land. Maybe I can make that. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Yeah? Yeah, please. Um, we'll, take, we'll take a few in there. <coughs> Hi, um, my name is uh, Stephen Costello. I, um, about two weeks ago, 
I uh, left the UN mission in South Sudan, so I was there for the past year. Uh, I was black UN, not blue UN, so to speak. Um, I worked for a section called the Joint Mission Analysis Center, and I was one of the one of the uh, the analysts, uh, conflict analysts, intelligence analysts for uh, for Unity State. Um, but I did sit in all the meetings with the, not all, but many of the meetings with the humanitarians when we would have coordination meetings. And I recall from, from you know, May to June, there was this absolutely uh, horrific uh, offensive that went on in, in Unity State. And as a result, Koch, Lear, Mayan did these areas, um, huge massacres, huge displacement, certain famine is, is, is coming. The same is true in southern central Equatoria, where there's another ongoing, uh, ongoing offensive there. You know, I can't remember anybody in any of these me Maybe it's just because at my level, the sort of mid-level bureaucrat level, but I mean, people were well aware that the conflict was driving this. There was nobody burying their head in the sand. And I kind of read every article I could. I used to check the news every day as to what was going out in the press, and there was not nearly enough that came out in the press about this. I tried to leak it myself, to be honest. But when it was addressed by the mission, when the SRSG, David Shearer, addressed it, they, they did lay the blame at the foot of the, the government. I mean, it, it has been said many times. And, it, and, you know, we could talk about this all day, and I'll just leave it with, I mean, in terms of addressing the political problems that, that have, that have made South Sudan what it is. I've worked there three times in the last 10 years. Um, you know, IGAD might as well uh, just rent out the Hilton in Addis because, you know, every six months to a year, they're back, they're back in there talking again. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a deal they have now, but no, every, you know, everybody who knows that the country knows that it hasn't addressed the underlying problems. Um, anyway, I just thought, yeah, I'd throw it is, out there. Is that much. your question? Well, my, I guess I don't really have a question. I guess I would just make those, those observations and see what, what uh, the panel would say Which about is it. your question of the type, uh, the, the government is being blamed, it, it, so it what was, can it, be done? It was of the type that I, I don't get the, I didn't get the sense while I was there that there was um, a d dismissing of the political causes okay. of, the, of the conflict. Yeah, no, I think that's yeah. a nice point, thanks. Uh, and we'll take this one over here. Thank you. Um, speaking from someone who also recently came from South Sudan um, and worked on uh, a development project there for two and a half years, um, I think that it's interesting that um, what you've seen in Bashar and his ability to manipulate the um, international community governments over the past 20 years has sort of come down and been passed on to South Sudan, and I was wondering if you could speak to that, and uh, if that's something that has that is in the discussions right now, when it comes to Darfur and um, the crisis in Sudan, um, and also, I would echo his sentiments that, yeah, I don't think that this is something that the community, the humanitarian community is burying their heads in the sand about. I think it's just something that, especially when it comes to the Troika, that whatever progress can be made won't be made without significant pushes from the top. That any progress that is made can be ruined at any second based on, yeah, a government insurgency in WOW or anywhere in Unity State. Okay, uh, so, yeah. And I'm sure that the same can be said for Darfur. Okay, thanks. So I guess you're alluding to what uh, the Sphere Project said, humanitarian action can't substitute for political action. Like, there is an acknowledgement of political factors. Uh, Suzanne, can you um, answer? I mean, that, partic on that particular issue... I don't need to that. Well, if you could lean forward, because are we still being recorded? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I think it's on now. Oh, um, I think on that particular issue, um, there's there's a, a, a difference between when you talk about an uh, acute phase of a crisis and and more in a protracted crisis. Um, and I think you know now in South Sudan or Darfur in 2004 2005, I think at that time the the problem was kind of 
was visible and, and the, the politics was very evident. Um, but I, mean, I can't I can't say too much about South Sudan actually because I mean I I, um, I mean I, I, I guess I, I included it in Sudan up until independence, um, but I haven't followed the, the current uh, conflict too closely. But but I think in in, in Darfur that kind of making the conflict invisible has kind of gradually developed over time because, because you know, access has been restricted, um, because there's a kind of uh, an urge amongst most kind of organizations to kind of move away from the kind of acute phase of the humanitarian operation and to start kind of building recovery and whatever. And I, I think the, the kind of the... And you know, and then you had kind of new kind of scientific developments in nutrition. So it was the kind of the combination of all of these things together that kind of resulted in kind of a move away from from well, I mean that that just kind of made it more difficult to see some of the more uh, uh, well the ongoing violence and the ongoing kind of conflict that that was happening. So I'll. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. David? Yeah, I mean, I think those, those are really uh, valuable points in a way, and good, good to me, good sort of correctives. I think, you know, Suzanne talks about this uh, phenomenon uh, that uh, Stanley Cohen wrote about, you know, and, and Zoe wrote about this as well, the idea of knowing and not knowing. So in a sense, it's not that people are not, not aware of a lot of the political factors, political constraints. Um, it's not that they're not interested. You know, and often people who work for aid agencies are incredibly knowledgeable about all the different kinds of local politics. And you get these very informed discussions. And you found it in, in uh, Sri Lanka as well, which I mentioned, you know, 2009, these incredibly uh, passionate and knowledgeable people, often somewhat lower down the hierarchy, I would say, and you mentioned your level of these organizations. And then at the same time, I think what you tend to get, you know, depending on the international context and the international diplomatic priorities, is a diminishing degree of frankness as you proceed up the hierarchy and up the salary scale, in a way, of different organizations, particularly within the UN. And you also get a, a phenomenon where people will perhaps condemn certain actions, but then uh, they'll do it kind of sotto voce, and simultaneously there'll be something like the US will be lifting sanctions off from the, the, the Khartoum regime, you know, which sends a very strong signal and in a way negates all kinds of things that might be said at a lower level within these various organizations. So I think it isn't, it isn't ignorance or lack of interest in politics. It's knowing and not knowing. It's systems that sort of almost feel a need to put politics aside sometimes in order to function. And it's different degrees of uh, openness and honesty, uh, to some extent, depending on where you sit within these different organizations. Thank you, Nora. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think the, these points are really well uh, made. I think sometimes it's, I mean, as David says, it's, it's, there's a link, but there's a, or there's a disconnect between knowing, knowing the political situation in the country where you work, but also then how, how those are turned into action. So when you look at the actual tools and policies that are driving food aid, how much of them are reflecting the political realities within which um, the so-called emergency or the protracted situation is taking place. Sometimes there's, there's, there's literally a split between the political and humanitarian sides of the UN or of uh, different organizations. And so the, the two are deliberately tasked with with very different things, and it's sort of kept, it, it's deliberately kept separate in a sense. Um, while I work in Somalia, there's re there was several years ago a bringing together of the political and the humanitarian sides within one, a, sort of one UN house. 
which carries with it its own set of risks as well, because then the idea that humanitarian assistance can be set apart from, can be impartial and neutral, absolutely goes down the train. <laughs> and maybe that's okay, because maybe it does anyway, in a real context, and at least you then have it out on there on the table. But, um, the, you know, the, so there's not necessarily a perfect solution. But I think even with, and, and then you have also the, the realities that many organizations feel that they can't take uh, explicit aim at the, at the political realities in, with, with which they work because they worry about losing access, being expelled from a country, not being able to work in the area. But even within those constraints, there's more that can be done, I think. I think that we would all say there's more that can be done to um, overcome the short-term emergency nature of things. Try, you know, you're, you're dealing with a tool, emergency food aid, to try to solve a problem, which is food insecurity in Sudan, chronic food insecurity in Sudan as a result of a chronic conflict and other issues as well. And the tool is not fit for the problem. There's got to be more that can be done, even with these constraints that we're talking about. Um, more questions? Should I say something about um, agricultural? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Good, yeah. Yeah, sorry, just quickly about mechanized agriculture. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, this is very much kind of focused in the central Sudan and kind of controlled by the kind of wealthier um, elite. So not necessarily something that, um, you know, can develop the country as a whole. In fact, I mean, this is, I mean, uh, this really, uh, sorry? I mean, on the contrary, since mechanized agriculture has such a detrimental effect oh, right, on right. Yeah. 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 are there any efforts to counter that maybe? Introducing things which can reverse the desertification of the, I think, um, I think it's 30% already desert, and that's right, being pushed right, right. more so with mechanized agriculture, which consumes enormous amounts of water. Uh, right. Water as well. Is, are there any efforts to try to take on the two issues as a as a sort of? Um, I I don't know that I can really answer that. I mean, I think. I mean, maybe the, the, the main thing is that, you know, up until very recently, there has really hardly been any kind of major development aid to Sudan. I mean, most of it's been made mainly humanitarian assistance because of kind of the ongoing conflict. So, so from a kind of uh, aid perspective, not really, not much as, as far as I know. No. Thanks. Um, can we take another round of questions? Yes, please. Hi, I think this goes out more to um, Laura, but just based on what you were saying just now, that there is a certain margin to even within humanitarian aid be integrating a, a concept of sustainability. Could you illustrate a bit what that would look like? Is that something that you've seen possibly manifested in Somalia or anywhere else, and just in a tangible sense? Okay, thanks. Yeah, please. Um, thank you, Suzanne, and also David and Laura for a fascinating uh, presentation. Um, when I think of 2008, I think of the global financial crisis, and I think of food riots in the global south. And I just wondered if you could say more about those maybe, or more about the res resilience regime that you were talking about in relation to kind of, you know, wider sort of global structures. I mean, David mentioned the war on terror. And obviously in 2008, you're seeing a kind of hyper, almost a kind of hyper neoliberalism, um, you know, that we're, that we're sort of experiencing, of course, the, the, the kind of move towards a kind of, digital humanitarianism or post-humanitarianism. I just wondered whether we could explain, I mean, you talked about the, the different perceptions and all of that is really fascinating. I just wonder whether we can also explain um, that shift in 2008 to, to those wider to kind of structural um, questions. Oh, I was going to ask for the microphone. I've got a, quite a specific question I'd like to ask because we what some of the things we study in, in the security course. Uh, so we look at Alex Duval's work, Jane Aiken's work, and the idea of the criminalization of famine. And Alex Duval has talked obviously quite a lot about Sudan and the fact that there are some individuals who are prominent and their, their work is well known in the creation of famine. Um, how do you see that? Is that a way forward? Is that something that is possible to 
institute in a concrete way, or is it a kind of philosophical approach to it? Okay, so, yeah. 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 Shall I just, um, shall I just, oh, actually, Laura, do you want to yeah. answer that question first? Yeah, so the question was about uh, what would these longer term approaches to dealing with extreme food insecurity look like? So, uh, I mean, a whole range of things. I think one of the, the hallmarks of long-term food aid is that it is precisely that, it's food delivered. And the assumption is that people need food, so you give them food. When over a long period of time, what people usually need more is cash and access to cash and being able to earn, get that themselves. So there's huge innovations going on in humanitarian work on cash programming of which there's a burgeoning literature as well, if you're interested in that. Um, and within the kind of refugee field as well, there are experiments going on right now with trying to give uh, refugees access to employment um, in, in Jordan, soon to be in Ethiopia as well. Um, those are, I mean, there are interesting questions around what else refugees might need besides a job. Um, and I, I think that sometimes that, that discussion gets instrumentalized where the, the idea is just give, give displace people access to employment and then they don't need anything else but that's a sort of separate topic the point being that 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 really they need access to to, to um, an, a source of income for themselves um, Ethiopia did something interesting probably 15 years ago where um, it was chron it was always having the same number three to five million people were in need of food food assistance and they realized that actually some of those many of those people, at that time, about three million people were in, were actually chronically affected. That means every every year, they were so they were at this sort of tipping point between being food insecure and uh, not being able to meet their needs and, and needing support. And then there were the acute food secure food insecure who were affected by a, a sudden short-term uh, effect. Maybe it was um, flooding or a sudden drought in a particular place, or you know that that particularly got worse. I mean, drought's not a sudden uh, crisis, but it's something that was more limited in time. Um, and so they disaggregated the acute and the chronic food insecure. And that actually had quite uh, an important impact because it meant that you could deal with chronic food insecurity with a different set of strategic support mechanisms, grants, credit, training, education and employment, a whole range of things. And it was just that the people who had been, you know, whose crops had been washed away by a flood would receive food aid. It's a bit of a smarter use of food aid in that sense. Um, so there are those kinds of things. But as well, we find that food aid typically tends to work against people's resilience, as I said before. So um, the idea that people need to report to a central center in order to pick up their food aid deliveries means that they tend to congregate in towns and cities rather than on their farms. Um, so just decentralizing the way that one distributes support trying to dis distribute support in cash so that people can access markets instead, a whole range of different things that can be done. But typically it's, you know, the idea is you respond with food. I think that's starting to change in small ways, but it's still a predominant model of response. Thanks, Sarah. Right, um, yeah, I mean, 2008 and the, the food crisis, the financial crisis. Um, yes, I, I mean, I think that it was a, it was a a key factor in kind of the shift towards the resilience regime, in particular because it's, I mean, it, it kind of, um, well, I mean, it's, it's, there were a kind of a range of kind of uh, initiatives, and I'm desperately trying to remember it kind of with, with um, you know, convened by, by FAO, and um, wasn't there a kind of global, um, global kind of uh, strategy? But, but I think maybe more importantly, I think, because of kind of limited funding for kind of aid agencies or, 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 or UN agencies, you had the kind of emergence of these public-private partnerships and kind of uh, much, much greater involvement of the kind of the, the private sector in um, addressing, well, first of all, a, a, a key, I mean, <coughs> after the kind of food crisis and the food rights, um, a real kind of emphasis on food security and nutrition. Um, as a means to resilience, as a means to kind of uh, greater stability, I think. Um, and, you know, so you see these kind of uh, uh, global initiatives like that, the scaling up, uh, scaling up Nutrition Movement, the New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition. And I mean, they all, I guess, um, again, well, because this is the way I looked at it in terms of regimes of practices, you have all these kind of different <coughs> factors coming together, a kind of an increased emphasis um, 
on behalf of the West on kind of food security and nutrition as a, as a way of kind of uh, uh, creating greater stability. Um, you have, uh, uh, I mean, there was also a series of studies in the Lancet which kind of, you know, uh, promoted the kind of standard package for addressing malnutrition. Then kind of inter interest from kind of private sector in, in doing that. So you, um, you see a kind of convergence of interest in um, you know promoting uh, food security and, and nutrition as a way of kind of promoting stability and resilience, and you know this also. I mean, at the same time, it's kind of like I said, it's 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 convenient for countries like Sudan, where you know it's 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 much better to say, okay, we can solve nutrition by this kind of. Uh, you know, and, and that's where you get the kind of the hyper neoliberalization where you can kind of solve, say you can solve malnutrition by, you know, these specialized products and saying that, you know, we, if we improve nutrition by itself, that will kind of lead to economic growth. So there's an interest there in the part of the Sudan government, also in the part of kind of Western donors, because it seems like a cheap way or cost effective way of promoting uh, growth and, and stability. Um, I, I certainly read some papers where they say, you know, even nutrition is now included in kind of national security strategies, I mean, from of Western kind of nations. And of course, on the part of the private sector, I mean, it's, this is a kind of, you know, a huge opportunity. I mean, suddenly malnutrition is a business opportunity. And you can see a kind of range of kind of products developing. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that are, that are being sold to in, 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 in countries like Sudan and others as well. And then, of course, it, it also, it's also quite kind of suitable for remote management because if you have a standardized package, you don't actually need to do a more in-depth uh, analysis of you know, what's really going on in terms of the nature of food insecurity it's, and, its, and its causes. Um, and... Yeah, so I mean, I think globally, the, the food crisis was, was one thing that kind of um, kind of revived this interest in nutrition, but in, 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 in a very uh, different way uh, than, you know, nutrition was seen in the 1980s and, and 90s. Um, and that kind of leads me to the criminalization of famine. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot, uh, particularly because... Um, Alex Duell actually talks about social nutrition as, 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 as maybe one way of um, uh, providing evidence for, uh, you know, to promote accountability for, for, for mass starvation. Um, and I'm still thinking about this, actually. I mean, first of all, I mean, I've just, I've just said all the kind of the powerful motivations as to why you know, nobody is really looking anymore at the kind of the social and political causes of malnutrition. So to now say we're going to revive that to assist in the criminalization of famine, I mean, there's just so many, so many things to think about. I mean, and, and, I mean, so is, is um, you know, what incentive would there be for somebody, and I don't know who either, to start looking more at the political causes of, of famine, given all the constraints that we've just talked about. So big, big questions there. In terms of individuals, uh, also big questions. I don't really know. I don't really know. But I noticed that Alex has just written, a, did you see his article in The Guardian um, that um, just now, that um, he wrote that um, um, Mohammed, uh, anyway, the, one of the, 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 the crown prince should be uh, prosecuted for uh, crimes of starvation. Mm -hmm. So he's already, he's already starting that. <laughs> okay, okay. I hope, hope he's going to get onto Theresa May and austerity soon as well. Um, <laughs> uh, David, did you have something else to say? Yeah, I was just going to say quickly. Um, I mean, Suzanne just said that, you know, these uh, 2008 food crisis and the price, you know, crisis in the price of food, you know, this was a sort of a key moment for the resilience regime. I, you know, I think it is worth emphasizing in a way that that, that sort of, that was one of the moments of, if you like, maximum uh, international responsibility 
for crises, you know, that are often portrayed uh, as local. You know, and you had people moving out of the housing market, moving into food speculation. You have a lot of food traders who, you know, I, I used to work in the city, and if you have a, if you have kind of volatility, price volatility, that's regarded on the whole as a good thing because that's an opportunity to make profit as a as a trader. But I think, that, you know, this was a moment of, if you like, maximum international responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it led, in a way, through a, a sort of a perverse logic to that moment of, in a way, maximum blaming of the local, you know, or identification of responsibility at the extreme, sort of, in a way, within the household. I think Mark Duffield, you know, I've only just read some of it, but he's clearly quite influenced by Suzanne's work in particular, when he talks about the, uh, the medicalization of aid and this sort of increasing focus on smaller and smaller units, you know, so the national rather than the international, the local rather than the national, the household, uh, as an, a, an arena where you can identify responsibility for nutritional and health uh, problems. And I think there are, you know, part of, Mark's worry in that book is that a certain kind of political systems analysis associated in a way with the old left, you know, it, it is going missing. It kind of came back a little bit in 2008. I'm not quite sure sort of where it is now, but it's, it's worth observing how, you know, one discourse tends to sort of push out another and this, the rise of this kind of medical discourse is you know it doesn't it's not without consequences for other ways of interpreting the world okay um do we have some more questions from the floor yes please Hi, um, I was just wondering when you talk about the acute and the protracted phase of conflict, if you look at Yemen now, would you describe it in the acute phase or is it already the protracted phase? And then who would you want, who Yemen. would you hold accountable and how far does accountability go also? And all in a state that is so s fragmented actually and um, where obviously malnutrition is highly politicized, so you can't really separate it, but you also have a um, the problem of access for humanitarian aid workers for delivery of um, food aid. So I was just wondering where you see that. And also, in general, I find it very difficult to differentiate between the acute state of an emergency and when do you call it the protracted phase when... Um, you don't necessarily know when, where it's going. Yeah, sorry. Um, should we take another couple, if there are another couple of questions? Yes, please, back. Um, so I had more of a general question, actually. Um, and it was something that David said, that people often talk about the victories and what we can do something about much more than what we can't. I think this is a problem. Sorry, I, I work in communications. <laughs> so I'm mostly for charities and non-profits. And this is definitely a problem, because I think internally people are reflecting on all of these issues. But obviously the impression they want to present externally is one that we want to see that the approach is working and especially then there's the tension between the funders and the supporters you don't really want to hear about what's not working um, so I just <coughs> wondered if you had any advice for practitioners or how this could be applied on a day to day basis um, for people representing charities, aid organisations, social enterprises and so on um, and this tension between yeah, oversimplifying some complex situations but also on the other hand over dramatising over some with the whole what, lead, what bleeds leads in the news and so on and so forth. Yes, yeah, so if you had any advice on that. Thank you very much. And a third question? Yes, again, please. No, no, take the floor, seize it and love it. <laughs> um, I think it was just, it was building on the response that Laura gave, but maybe it can be opened up to um, 
Suzanne as well, but my question was more in terms of what does this look like in a situation of conflict? Because the, the productive safety net program that was rolled out in Ethiopia was under a politically stable regime and an and absence of conflict, right? But even then it could be co-opted um, by allegiance to the political party. Like, I, I know that there are instances where even this combination program, which was really great, um, wouldn't be provided or given to individuals unless if they pledged you know, allegiance to um, the PRDF, which is the ruling party. But what does this look like in a situation of conflict where you already have this sort of like criminalization of, of the, um, yeah, of the, like, the assistance and any kind of humanitarian goods that are provided? So, yeah, what, what kind of framework then could we be employing and under the constraints that people are working with? Thank you. Um, Laura, do you want to start? Um, I, th I suspect we could all answer, all, try to have a stab at all three of those questions. But um, in terms of Yemen, I mean, in, in a way, Yemen is, to my mind, is a, is a kind of layered, acute and protracted situation at the same time. I mean, typically, in displacement circles, when you talk about protracted displacement, you talk about anything that's more than five years, and I think conflict is a similar kind of thing. So clearly, um, there are elements of, of, the, of conflict in Yemen that even predate the current sort of um, kind of dynamics with Saudi Arabia. Uh, that mean that Yemen has already been a protracted a situation, a site of protracted conflict and the protracted food insecurity as well. And those two things, of course, go together hand in hand. But then you have these layers of acute, extreme food insecurity at the same time. Um, I think what that means is then having different, uh, having approaches that speak to those, ex I mean, uh, you know, we're kind of giving humanitarian assistance a really bad time tonight, but let's be clear, there are, there are you know, life-saving functions of humanitarian assistance that are well-placed and, um, and particularly over a short period of time to stabilize the situation, uh, you know, I think none of us would argue against, we're not necessarily saying that that shouldn't be provided. It's just that when, from, at least from my perspective, when that is all that's provided over a long period of time, that's when the problems start to emerge. So, so you need to have a very um, nuanced kind of an approach and clearly it's, it's not gonna be perfect because humanitarian access is extremely problematic because the dynamics of the conflict are unpredictable and you know, it's one of the most difficult environments to work in, uh, unfortunately, I mean, uh, here at SOAS. I've, several times taught a, a course on famine and food security, and at the end of the course we always say, you know, actually, and in VCD as well, we say, you know, unfortunately, these are the jobs that are most available to new graduates because the turnover is very high, nobody really wants these kinds of jobs, or if they do, they don't want them for very long, and, um, and they're the most challenging. You have to have a, an extremely well-informed political sense, you, and you have to have a million other kinds of skills in your pocket um, and that's, that's something that usually, ideally, is gained over time, and it's not something, something that is often uh, that you, you leave SOAS or the LSE or anywhere else with uh, right off the bat. So there's a problem there. Um, sorry, that's a slight digression. Um, the question about how this acute and uh, uh, chronic approaches in times of conflict, again, it's incredibly difficult because of the lack of access in many situations. Um, but it's often the case as well, I mean, you can, you can overemphasize the extent to which, or the ways in which conflict affects a society. So, I mean, in Somalia, for instance, we say that it's been without a state and affected by conflict since 1991. <coughs> it's not actually the case. So between 1995 and 2005, things were relatively stable. There wasn't a central government, but there was quite effective local government that was in place. There was also less humanitarian assistance being provided, whether that was a cause or an effect of the peace, we're not really sure, but there was a coexistence of um, kind of relatively stable <laughs> political situation, relatively low levels of violence, low levels of displacement, and low levels of aid. So I think there's something that we can learn from that kind of um, an approach as well. So just to say that there, even in situations of conflict, there are often areas in which one can have a more um, a developmental focus or a more kind of one that reaches into the political roots of what's happening in a, in a community rather than just a humanitarian kind of short-termist approach. Um, yeah, and then I guess the question about how to deal on a day-to-day -day basis with 
it's of course, you know, what we're, we, it's not, of course, we're not coming up with a totally new ideas that no one's ever thought of. We know that in the, in the evenings when people sit around at the end of the day in their NGO houses, they talk about these issues all the time. Yet the problem is they don't get worked into the ways of operating. And um, sometimes one can talk oneself into the idea that it's impossible to do that when in fact it's not impossible to do that. And there are really great examples in the history of humanitarianism where people have taken a, a risk and, and tried to break down some of those barriers with some success. So um, it's not a great, great response, but I would say uh, look at where those, those barriers have been broken down to try to figure out how to do it. Thanks, Laura. Um, David, are you ready to go? Uh, in what sense? Are you um, ready to go? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, I just wanted to, people don't normally ask me for practical advice, so I thought, okay, since I can't really organize my own office, never mind, like, sort out anything bigger, but in, in terms of the, uh, I, that sort of climate of, in a way, self-promotion and not admitting mistakes and so on, I think it is quite a, a huge problem in a way, and I have a sense that, um, you know, because there are, particularly in this country, you know, with papers like the Daily Mail, they seem to be, in a way, ready to seize on any sign that things are going wrong in the humanitarian sector or that taxpayers' money is being wasted and so on. So I think it's kind of fed into quite a defensive mentality in a way where people don't want to admit mistakes because there's a perception there's a lot of sort of enemies out there. But I, I, I don't know, I mean it's difficult to challenge that, but sometimes I feel that, uh, more intuitively anyway, that because NGOs have sort of found themselves in this position of trying to portray themselves as purer than pure, that somehow seems to, it kind of riles people up in a, in a, in a, in a Trumpian sense, you know, and people are looking for ways to sort of find, if you like, the hypocrisy of the liberals. And, and, and some of the hypocrisy, in a way, is, is, is real, I think, and some of it isn't. But practically, I would say that if you are sort of in the lucky position of being able to give out money, like as a donor, or maybe an NGO that's giving money to a local partner and so on, you can actually choose in a way to reward a report that says, oh, everything went amazingly well and it was all fantastic. Uh, or you could reward the report that says, well, we actually, there was this, these failures, these successes, and we demonstrate in this report our understanding of the local political and cultural context and why things worked or they didn't work. And it would be, I think, if, that, if those sort of self-accounts uh, were rewarded, it would be, in a way, a different climate in terms of the, this sort of self-promotion. Uh, but obviously, you know, there are elements of that already. Thanks, Suzanne. Yes, I think, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, in terms of the, um, I mean, how to, um, I mean, I think the, the, the thing is, that working in protracted crisis is just really, really difficult, um, you know, whether it's in Yemen or in Sudan or in, in, um, in South Sudan. Um, so in terms of kind of looking at the kind of, you know, the, 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 the political aspects or accountability for famine, I think... I mean, what I've said in relation to Sudan is to, to really, I mean, as, as David said earlier, I mean, uh, you know, international aid workers do know at some level, it's just not incorporated in, 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 in the methodologies, um, Sudanese aid workers know even more. I mean, they've often been working for 20, 30 years in the same field. So it's, it's kind of finding a way of kind of combining that knowledge with the currently more kind of quantitative, uh, remote um, collection of data, and even even if it's not possible to, um, you know, write it in a report. I mean that there is. I mean, even that that information is kind of transferred informally. 
uh, to, or, or, or at least uh, verbally, to um, you know donors, to embassies. Um, so that it's um, yeah, which is one way of kind of making making the the, the issues uh, visible again. And I mean, this will also help with kind of you know this kind of. You know, it doesn't really matter whether it's kind of cash or <coughs> agricultural support or food aid. I mean, you, you need this in the protracted crisis, this kind of constant kind of deliberation of, you know, if I do this, what will the consequences be? Or, you know, if, you know, so it's, it's just thinking through of, um, yeah, how, how you address things in, 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 in protracted crisis. And I mean, I think, you know, as all of us said, there's no, there's no perfect, there's no perfect um, solutions. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, extend a, a, an extra special thanks for Suzanne for her work, for her publication. Congratulations on the publication of your book. <laughs> Please do remember to buy it. It's £40. Uh, also, thank you very much indeed to David Keane for coming along today, all the way from the LSE. Uh, for, for Laura, who I, I am, she's supposed to be my colleague, I haven't seen her for about two and a half years, so it's great to see her as well. Um, you also are not allowed out of the room before you've picked up a flyer, says Faisy. Um, Fire, which we'll tell you all about next term. Come back and see us next term. Come and join in. Um, there's a reception uh, in the in the SCR with wine and something. Nibbles. <laughs> <laughs> you get them when you get there. Um, and there's a little leaflet. Yes, great. The book again. Um, thank you very much indeed to everyone for coming. Congratulations on surviving up until eighth week of this this term. Have a very good break. Uh, a very lots of lots of rest. A nice new year. And see you next term.